name we pray. Amen. Um, when I was training to be a conductor with the Union Pacific Railroad, I would get called all kinds of different places that I've never been. Obviously, train goes places that a lot of people never get to see. And so as I was training, I would get called to a place called uh, Dunsmere. And that, that's up in the Sierra Mountains, and um, it was steep grade territory. And they told me, first day when I got on the train, I was sitting there ready to start whatever it was I was going to be trained for, to be a conductor. They told me, now, one of the most important things that we do is we restrain this train. <clears throat> I didn't know what he meant by that. He said, well, we restrain it because as we go down this grade, we cannot reach a speed greater than about 40 miles an hour. If we reach a speed greater than 40 miles an hour, the brakes will burn out and we won't be able to stop. And uh, I said, Whew, <laughs> do a good job. <laughs> And uh, as you can imagine, having that information, I was, uh, I was awake. I was alert. I kept an eye on the engineer. I kept an eye on the speed limit. Um, what was <laughs> so interesting to me was that they would put us up in casinos to stay the night for the train going home the next day. Well, that was mostly, that was when you went downhill. <laughs> A lot of these fellows would stay up drinking and gambling and doing all kinds of obscene things, and they'd come to work tired. Sometimes we'd get called in the middle of the night. That's when I really had to be vigilant. <laughs> and so we're cruising along, and we're going down this steep grade, and I'm getting tired myself, and it's very quiet in the cab. Finally, I kind of just mm, <laughs> do that little note. You know, the train rocks back and forth, so, you know... <laughs> It's horrible. Well, I look over, I wake up, and I look over, and I see the speed is 40 miles an hour. And I look at my engineer, and he's doing the same thing I was doing. <laughs> I said, hey! <laughs> and he snapped out of it, and he started putting air to the, to the train, and, and he got it under control. I was really happy. <laughs> but, you know, I was thinking about that as I was preparing this lesson, and I wondered about our country. And what speed are we at right now? You ever wonder that? Are we going too fast? Have we hit a point of no return with regard to the morals of this nation? So when people no longer have a reason to do right, when they no longer fear God, when they no longer entertain the idea that they must someday stand in judgment before God Almighty, what is left for them? When they no longer believe that there's an absolute code of morality to which they are responsible, when they no longer believe that there is a clear distinction between good and evil, between right and wrong, when all of those restraints are gone, I ask the question, what is there to hold a person back? Well, part of why I went through these various systems of morality last week was to show that they have absolutely no force behind them. When a person does not see right and wrong, good and evil anymore, as absolutes, and when a person no longer fears standing before God in judgment, there is no restraint. And the brakes are going to burn off. Um, I can't help but wonder where we, at, where we are at in that process for this country. And how far have they reached into the church as well? Um, Proverbs 29, 18. I want to think about this for just a minute. Where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. Well, what is he, what is he saying there? Where there is no prophetic vision. That's another way of saying where there's no word of God. Where
where God doesn't exist in the hearts and minds of people, what happens? They throw off restraint. And they live however they want to live. And we're seeing that, aren't we? In 2 Timothy 3, 12 through 15, Paul says this, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and imposters will go from bad to worse. From bad to worse. He goes on and he says, deceiving and being deceived. But as far as you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it. There's a spiritual principle here that reminds me of the terminal speed that that train hits. And that's this, that there's a natural progression. Spiritually here, there is a natural acceleration process when God is removed from people's lives. And what is it? They go from bad to worse. They throw off restraint and they just do worse and worse and worse. Once we turn loose of the divine standard from regulating human conduct, wicked people accelerate, look here, they accelerate their wickedness. Now, knowing that, consider our world. <laughs> where men don't even know they're men anymore. And women don't either. Now, have we gone from bad to worse? I think that we have. The Bible teaches this principle, and I would say experience shows this to be true as well. What will reverse the tide that we see right now? We have gone at an accelerated rate headlong into wickedness. So the question is, what will restrain it? Well, the Word of God is like those brakes on that train. The Word of God, that's why Proverbs says, where there is no prophetic vision, there is no restraint. Why? Because the Word of God is like the brakes on that train, slowing it down, restraining it, stopping it. And... It's what will do it for our children. It's what will keep us in line as well. So the word of God for many people, that word is gone, but it cannot be for us. This is what Jesus says. In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under the feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hilltop cannot be hidden, nor do people light a candle and hide it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So here's the question here. What, what, does he, what does he mean by this? Well, he's pretty much told us, right? It's not a hard passage to figure out. We are not to look like the world. Is that a fair assessment of that passage? We're different. We talk differently. We walk differently. We dress differently. We behave differently. If you cannot look at me and tell the difference between me and the People in the world, I have been become a miserable failure in my Christian endeavor. In my walk with Christ and in my goal to glorify Jesus, I am a failure if people cannot tell that I am different. Um, and so I ask this question, and this is the question. When we go through this study of morality, we need to ask ourselves this question. How committed am I to living a godly life in this world? Now, I'll say this, we're all committed, right? I don't think I would go to anybody in this room or anybody in this church and say, hey, are you committed to God? And they go, no way. No, they wouldn't say that. I'm committed until God asks us to change. Then we start going, well, you know. And what do we start doing? We start inserting all kinds of excuses as to why it's perfectly fine the way I'm doing things. And really what we're saying 
is we're saying that I like who I am, I like what I'm doing, I don't want to change. So maybe I can come up with a new interpretation. Maybe I can come up with a new view of this passage. So when we're called to change our behavior, that's where the rubber meets the road, doesn't it? It's challenging. That's why I consider this an extension of those hard passages. <laughs> because as we get into the Word of God and we begin to study, we have to learn to be honest with ourselves, don't we? Do you know that there are many, many things in Scripture where God doesn't give you a black and white, here it is right there. This is wrong, this is right. No, but God calls on us to be mature people, to live above the bottom standard and accelerate our righteousness. And yet so many Christians are like, you ever see that cat on that TikTok or whatever where he's up there and he's got that cup? <laughs> Have you seen that, that video? And the, the owner said, don't you do it. Don't you do it. And he just keeps, and then whoosh, slides it off and it crashes on the ground. Do we treat God that way? That's a little more sobering thought, isn't it? That I'm over here getting as close to the edge as I can, trying not to fall off. That's a bad way to live. We need to accelerate our righteousness as much as the world accelerates their wickedness. And so when we go through these ideas, these thoughts... We may not get clear, distinct answers to all of our questions, but that's by design. God wants us to live above the baseline. You know, I think about this when I think about our giving. What was, what was the command to give in the Old Testament? What was that percentage? It was a tithe, right? It was 10%. Jesus removed that, didn't he? Did he remove that so we could do worse or so that we could do better? He removed it so that we could do better. You have said, hate your enemies. You have heard it said, hate your enemies. Pray for those, you know, love your, love your neighbor but hate your enemy. No, 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 that's not what Jesus said. Jesus says what? Pray for your enemy, right? Jesus takes us above that baseline standard. Get above these things. Do better. When Christ came, he came and eliminated all these little minutia of the law. Why? So that we can do worse than they? No, so that we can do better than they. So when we get into these passages, like that cat pushing that cup off, we have to remember God's giving us some thoughts so that we can go to the highest level of righteousness that we possibly can. When it comes to drinking, gambling, smoking, drug of choice, and whatever you want to insert there. Oftentimes I hear when I preach lessons like this is, well, you know, I, I know that there's, there's where, does, where does that exactly, where is that line at? Where, where is it that I can go to? Well, why don't you just go to the highest standard you possibly can? Because you love God that much. Ooh, brother. You're kind of extreme, aren't you, Brother Harrison? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess I am. Because when you love someone, you don't do the bare minimum. You do as much as you can. So we're going to look at some things this morning. I think that when we get up to the edge, we are doomed to fail. Romans 12 one through two, right? Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Well, this is what we're going to get into as we go through all of these lessons. There has been a great shift in our society, and that shift has resulted, I think, in a plague on the communities around us throughout our entire country. Where God has been replaced by government, nature has become the sanctuary, and sex is now the new worship. That's what our world is experiencing now. We have moved farther away from God, and this is where we are. We have heard this saying, sex sells. How long have we heard that? How long have they fed us that garbage? Oh, for decades now. 
How is our society selling sex? Well, you really don't have to go far to find out, do you? When they say sex sales, they're not actually talking about prostitution, are they? No. They're talking about advertisements. They're talking about making sin sexy and exciting. And they are feeding that to our children in a 24-hour regimen. You know... I don't know what it's like to live in a digital world entirely. I grew up before cell phones, even internet, right? Most of us in this room did. Well, maybe not most of us, some of us. (laughs) And there was no digital footprint, whatever that means, right? You just got up in the morning. You didn't look at the news. You didn't scroll through these little videos, And I wonder, I often wonder how difficult it must be for our young people to survive an environment like that with a constant diet of immorality coming into their eyes. You know what that means? That means that parents, church leaders, brethren have to be vigilant or we're going to lose another generation of young people to the world. That's the reality that we're living in. And it's scary when I think about young people and where they're headed. Where does all this begin? I'm going to tell you where this begins. Believe it or not, it begins with modesty. Modesty. But what is modesty? This is where people begin to, oh, I'm going to challenge you, Brother Harrison. Show me the, the, the direct standard for modesty in the Bible. Okay, you've already told me something about yourself. You don't like this subject. You're not looking to satisfy God. You're looking to satisfy a relationship that you have with your children. You're looking to satisfy your worldliness. We cannot get to a place where that's where we exist. We're going to have to do better than that. So there's a question here before us. Well, let's go back to the Old Testament. And let's ask some questions about where modesty ever even came from. Does anybody know? Where did this idea originate? That's right, Adam and Eve. I heard it faintly somewhere out there. (laughs) When God created man, Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, when God created the man, the man and the woman, the Genesis record says, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. We know, as a matter of fact, that that was not going to continue. But a husband and wife, naked, not ashamed, well, that's not a shocker, is it? Why did nakedness take on a different meaning for this couple. Well, there's an explanation, I think, in chapter 3. It says this, Then the eyes of both were opened. I think this is verse 21. I didn't write it down. The eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. I find this incredible. How did they not know they were naked before? (laughs) I mean, let's start asking some questions that are really logical questions, and I think we'll get to some rational answers here. Did they know they were naked before? Well, they could see that they weren't wearing anything, but something is happening here. There's a knowledge that is coming into their mind, and I think it's by the divine power, that's letting them know some things now. And they look at what they did. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. That's what the um, English Standard Version says. Well, what's going on? Are you telling me they didn't like to see each other naked anymore? Are you telling me, I mean, we know that they did because they had children later on. What is this trying to let me know? That a new environment is taking place and they're going to have to do something now. What is it? They're going to have to teach a new generation 
about right and wrong, about moral instructions, and it's starting with them with what? Modesty. Put some clothes on. I know this, this special knowledge, I don't think was necessarily for the two of them, but for what environment they have now created and for what was coming. I think it's significant that God didn't ask them to take off their loincloth, did he? He didn't rebuke them and say, get back to your nakedness. No, he did not. What did he do? Whatever they had done, God did not feel it was sufficient. And what did God do? He made them new garments out of animal skins and had them put those. In fact, the text says this, verse 321 here. Instead, he indicated, or it says this, and the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skin and he clothed them. God clothed them. What they did was not sufficient. Let me ask you this question. Here's, a, here's a, I think, a really reasonable question for the text. Does God have a standard of modest apparel? God clothed them. What do you think? Just say it, Will. Yeah, so, so then to answer the question, does God have a standard of modest apparel? Clearly he does. And it wasn't what Adam and Eve decided it was. It's what God decided it was. This is what we need to look for, brethren. We should not look for a standard that is subpar. We should look for God's standard. I think this is an area where man more blatantly disregards God than any other issue is the issue of modesty. Clothing is advertised to be daring, to be sexy, to be slightly wicked, and to be provocative. All it takes is to turn on your television or to scroll through any advertisement. My goodness, you advertise a cheeseburger in the same fashion as you advertise sex. We have lost our ever-loving mind when it comes to this issue. The problem with this rebellion against righteousness is all too often the church sees it the same way. Weak brothers and sisters in the Lord assume that sex apparel is a legitimate consideration for them in selecting their wardrobe. I don't think it is. In the summer months, uh-oh, it gets really bad, doesn't it? Things get worse and worse. Somehow what is sinful in the grocery store becomes perfectly fine on the beach. What is sinful at church activities, that's okay, you're going to a different location. And we have ignored this, I think, for, for quite a while now. So that you are in for a battle if you tell your children, hey, 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 get some clothes on. You're not going to the beach like that. Well, if you take a look at streets versus beaches, you'll see there's a huge distinction. People strip down to the bare minimum required by the law. Sometimes the law doesn't even require that. And many professing Christians are right there with them. Um, Paul told younger women to love their husbands and children, to be, here, here are a couple words we need to think about, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled, the ASV says sober-minded and chaste. 
chaste. If we will listen to God, He's providing us hints of what He expects, isn't He? He's giving us the details, not the line necessarily, but the details to live above everyone else in this world. And we have to listen to Him. Think seriously. Think about what it means to be chaste. And He's going to direct our ways. You see, sober-minded and chaste will produce an attitude that will guide a person's decision in clothing and how they present themselves to the world, won't it? Yes, sober-minded and chaste. On the other hand, the attitude of the world will produce a different type of wardrobe altogether. There's another passage, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9. Likewise also women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control. I I feel like I need to pause here for a minute. Who who seems to be the emphasis in all of these passages? Women. You know, God's not like the rest of the world. He's not going to pretend like he didn't make us different. The world will say, well, well, I'm a man, but I'm identifying as a woman. (laughs) I can see you. Do you know that? God's not going to play that game. God is not going to pretend as though he did not make us different. He doesn't care if we don't like that. He created them male and female. And God is seeing a distinction here. He's noting the distinction and he's giving instruction to accommodate that distinction. We need to listen to what he has to say. Do we encourage in our attitude and in our disposition towards young people to talk as, to walk, excuse me, as far up to the edge as they possibly can before falling off? I think sometimes we can do that. I think sometimes we encourage immodest apparel without intending to because we're encouraging the same attitude that God rejects. That let me just get right here. Well, why don't I just run back here? No, no, no. I like it up here because we don't like to look that different from the world, do we? I don't think that we do. It's uncomfortable. And it's certainly uncomfortable for children, for young people. And so they have to see in us, I think, a resolve to ourselves be different. Inevitably, there will be protest that modesty is a relative thing, brother. In fact, I think it was Brother Mark who told me about a time here at this congregation, long time ago, where there was a controversy about women wearing pants. Oh, no. However, people who live next to the beach, they see it differently. Well, again, God is not setting a a thick, dark line for us to see. He's giving us principles of righteousness and safe places to which we can flee, where we can be safe and know that we're safe. Because if God just gave a straight line and said, this is where you don't cross, everybody would be right there by. I got the line, right? No, but if he gives you principles of righteousness, those who truly love God are going to back away from it as far as they can. That's why God does this. He doesn't do it to hurt us. He does it to help us to be more righteous. So that principle, I think, well, you know, there, there's, no, there's no line, Brother Harrison. Well, I think that, that there is a line, and here it is. Whenever a person dresses so as to excite sexual desire in others, that person is dressing immodestly. That person is sinning. Even if they intend to or not. That principle reflects what the Bible teaches about modesty. And it does not change with culture, or guess what? The temperature in the room. It doesn't change. It's the same each and every time. Anybody who is sound enough of mind to be responsible to God for their conduct knows the difference 
between clothes that elicit a sexual reaction or excite sexual desire, they know, don't they? And young people who don't know, guess what? God bless them with parents who ought to know so that they can properly train them. This is a huge problem. And you know what the greatest problem is? Um, is consistency. That's the greatest problem. Listen, you can't wear that to church. You can't wear that to this youth activity. But when we go over here, it's perfectly fine. That's the problem. We give so many different messages to our children. Consistency is the problem. If it's wrong to wear to church, if I can't wear it in front of my brethren, then maybe I shouldn't wear it in front of the world. It seemed very reasonable to me, very rational. So if it's wrong for a teenage girl to wear shorty shorts in church and at church functions, then it's wrong to wear it at a track meet. Amen. It's wrong to wear it as a cheerleader. Amen. Could you imagine letting our young people walk in like that? No, let's train them better. Why? Because we're all going to die. None of us are going to get out of this thing alive. And we're going to stand before God. And what if this is the problem that leads my child to eternal ruin? That's a scary thought. Brother Will? That's right. Yeah, these principles apply to everyone, don't they? Male and female. But we're noting what the emphasis in Scripture is. And why is that? Again, I think God is recognizing the distinction. And it's a silly notion to think that women aren't aroused by a good-looking man. With all them muscles and his shirt off. Oh, Brother Harrison, stop. (laughs) Right? It'd be foolish to think that. God created us this way. And we need to help one another. Brother Benny? That's right. What Benny's referring to is on the railroad, there is a blue flag order. (laughs) And whenever a rail has carmen in it, they'll blue flag the track. And the reason they came up with the blue flag is because, as he said, all the rules that we have on the railroad are written in blood. Why then? Well, because somebody died because they weren't protected being on that train, fixing a wheel or brakes or something like that. And so he's referring to that in that that analogy that he gives. So here's the point that I'm making. If we're going to plead for modesty, we need to be consistent about this. We need to plead for it everywhere, every place, at any time. If we are Christians, then let us look the part, dress the part, play the part in all situations. There are many, many people who I think probably innocently enough, dressed immodestly. They dress like the world dresses, and they don't see what they're doing wrong. There's a woman by the name of Mary Quantz uh, who's considered the mother of the miniskirt. And this is what she said, why this was invented, why she did this thing. She said, many clothes, and it's not a lot of clothes, it's the little tiny clothes. Many clothes are symbolic of those girls who didn't want to wait until dark to seduce a man. So we may not know what the purpose of the miniskirt is. Well, there it is right there. 
at least acknowledge the designer's intent. Uh, Leo, um, I don't know how to say his last name. It's, I may have spelt it wrong because it is unpronounceable. But <laughs> he said, the woman, he, this is a designer, Leo, we'll just call him. <laughs> the woman who wears revealing clothes, who is sure of herself and thinks of sex more openly, is not concerned about nudity. She has a body and she knows it. So regardless of motives that a teenage girl or a young man might have, in wearing these clothes, at least let us acknowledge the designer's intent. The designer's intent was for what? To seduce and to make the clothes sexually arousing. And I think that they have, a, they have achieved their purpose. I think they have accomplished their goal. I'm not convinced that the women who wear such clothing are young men who throw off their shirts, uh, are unaware of the effects that that situation has on the opposite sex. I'm not convinced of that. Um, and I know that, that men who choose to do the same thing, I think they're aware of it as well. The rise of sex crimes, and we've known this for decades, will continue to rise until the problem passes. And what is the problem? Immodest apparel. Immodest apparel. Um, and I'll close with uh, just a couple more thoughts because we're running out of time here. But back in the 70s, I read this in, uh, in fact, one of the lectureship books here uh, from, I don't know which year, but it was back in the 70s. One of the authors made this point that there was a Portuguese ship, the Santa Maria, that was taken over by rebel pirates. According to the newspaper reports, and the newspaper was following the story very closely, according to the newspaper reports, that happened... Um, the first thing, rather, that happened when that ship was taken over by these pirates is that the women passengers stopped wearing shorty shorts, swimsuits, and halter tops. Why? Well, they recognized something, didn't they? They knew that they were in danger, and they knew that immodest apparel would only increase the danger for them. Because they understood what immodesty would do to the lust of these men. And they did not want to put themselves in that kind of danger. Well, let me tell you something. The danger still exists even if you're not taken over by pirates. Amen. The danger is there. Christian husbands and fathers know the perils of dress. And they're the leaders of the home. You're not going to convince me that any man is oblivious to a young teenage boy who sees a girl immodestly dressed. Men, you should be saying, Amen, Brother Harrison, because every single one of us know the truth of this reality. The solution is not with mom and their daughter. The solution is with the leader of the home, dad. Amen. And he needs to have the courage and the spiritual fortitude to start setting a better standard for his family, mom and daughter. Um, well, we're out of time. I have a few other things here, but I don't think I'm going to be able to get to them. But I think this introduces a problem that we're going to continue to see in this world because this world does not care about showing skin, but God does. And we need to be about looking for God's standard getting far away from immodest parable as we possibly can so as to please him. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it.